Prime Time Local News, serving the Lakeland and Midwest regions. Turning to news closer to home now, the annual mill rate bylaw was brought to council for its first reading yesterday. Here's Callan Dunlop with more. As stated in the Lloydminster Charter, council is required to annually pass a property tax bylaw. As it stands now, taxpayers may be seeing a 4.5% increase opposed to last year. Council discussed it thoroughly today and uh, you know we're going to stay with that four and a half percent tax increase that we have to pass on to taxpayers to ensure that we deliver a balanced budget. At the end of the day we have a budget with a $79,000 surplus. $79,000 on a $106 million budget. That's, uh, that's cutting it pretty fine. The city sees this tax increase as necessary but Council is confident that the growth of Lloyd Minster as a city will combat the spike. Growth and future growth is a huge thing. And if you can get that growth and assessment, it lessens the burden on general taxpayers. And we have had some growth in, in assessment over the last year. So that really does help uh, to offset the impact to each individual. All things considered, when you look at uh, inflation and all the projects that the city has going on and the increased costs that are being pushed down on us, like the increased RCMP costs, all things considered, I think it's, it's a pretty reasonable change. The mill rate bylaw will have a second and third reading on May 23rd. Callan Dunlop, Primetime, Local News. Students at Holy Rosary High School are holding a farmer's market, which will have a number of businesses that are ran and owned by students at the school. We always knew we had talent here um, and we had kids that were kind of had side hustles already that were selling things on the side and I thought you know what we need to showcase this a little bit. So we put it out there and we asked for applications and the stuff we got in is like mind-blowing actually. We have 28 vendors, um, everything from baking to we have uh, somebody doing Dungeons and Dragons kits. We've got crocheting and sewing and we've got buns, we've got like supper is going to be there, we've got specialty drinks. This is a great way for students to get experience with how a business works and be able to showcase their talents through the market. I think it's actually a big opportunity. Being that I'm in grade 12 too and looking at maybe like culinary school and things like that, that it just gives me a little bit of an opportunity. I think it's a really important skill to develop and hopefully some of them can, I know some of them are trying to do that after. Um, and even now I know some are still having that small business. And, just being able to go out there and continue that on is going to be a pretty spectacular. The farmer's market is cash only and will be taking place at Holy Rosary on May 25th from 3.30 to 7.30. The Aztec Safety Challenge is being co-hosted with Team Botcher here in the Border City. Our Thomas Wildman talked to one of the members of the Team Botcher about this exciting event. Today I am very honoured to have Mark Kennedy here, the third for Team Botcher and a world-renowned curler here today to talk to us about the Aztec Safety Challenge which will be coming to Lloyd this coming up January and so thank you so much for being with us today Mark. No problem Thomas, thanks for having me. We're, uh, I'm at Mosaic Stadium right now in uh, Saskatchewan so I'm a little bit uh, I'm an Alberta boy but happy to be here supporting a CFL team. All right Mark tell me a little bit about the how the Aztec safety challenge came to be the kind of conversations you had with Aztec and how the whole event came together. Yeah we uh, when we started talking with Caitlin and Jeff at Aztec safety last summer about sponsoring the team uh, I think it was just kind of an off-the-cuff comment about how great it would be to bring uh, a top-quality event back to Lloyd Minster. You know, we used to curl there almost every year at the Wayside Classic. Uh, loved our time there and, and thought, uh, is there anything we can do to try to bring that back? And, uh, you know, I think it struck a chord with Jeff and Caitlin. And, you know, when, when you put something in their minds, uh, there's a good chance it's going to get done. So they've kind of... Uh, you know, we, we created a spark and they've kind of turned it into a fire. And um, yeah, we're, we're really excited to be able to bring the world-class event back to Lloyd Minster. It's always been a big supporter of our sport. Um, and, you know, things have just kind of gone from there. And I know Caitlin and Jeff have done a ton of work to get things off the ground. And uh, we were able to announce the event officially last week. And we've already got a whole bunch of excitement from a bunch of teams here at the uh, 
at the Grand Slam. So we're looking forward to um, a big event close to home. It's going to be great. How exciting is it to have another large curling event just before the Grand Slam and be able to have it here in Lloydminster? It's, it's really important. It's very exciting. I think one of the big things for us is that um, there is a Grand Slam event um, the following weekend. So the Aztec safety event will be January 10th to 14th. Uh, and then we go straight to Red Deer for one of our bigger events of the year. So uh, by doing that, we're going to be able to attract a lot of the uh, European teams who are, you know, some of the best teams in the world. Um, Nicholas Adin, Bruce Mowat, Joel Retornas. You know, they're going to look to come to Canada to play a few events in a row. Uh, and they'll look to the Aztec safety event as kind of a nice build up towards that Grand Slam event in Red Deer. Um, and with a great purse and we're going to guarantee great ice conditions and, uh, you know, great volunteer committee. And um, it's just going to be an event that a lot of curlers are really looking forward to. We don't have a lot of top tier events outside of the Grand Slams. So anytime we can bring something to the table like this and, and help make it happen, um, I think the curlers get really excited and, um, and that makes us excited and, and having it close to home and, and in a community that we've always been really well supported. And now we're, um, Aztec safety has been behind us the whole way. So it's just a, a great story and we're excited to make it happen. All right, Mark. So the curling will be the main event of the Aztec safety challenge, but there's also going to be a junior curling camp as well as a few other events leading up to the event. Tell me how important those events are, especially the junior curling and about how important it is for you guys to raise up the next generation of curlers. You could argue it's probably one of the most important things that we do uh, outside of, of playing our own events is to give back to that next generation of curlers. That's how we all got started. Uh, so, you know, we consider that a big responsibility of ours. Um, when we did the junior clinic uh, last year in Lloyd, we had a great turnout, lots of excited kids, uh, but lots of kids that haven't been able to see a top tier event. So they're going to be able to come out and watch um, you know, for, for really cheap to come and watch the curlers that they've been watching on TV all these years. Uh, and also to come out in a junior clinic and, and it might not just be us out there helping the kids, but we might get some other top level players that the kids can have access to. So, you know, that's an extremely important part of what we do. Um, in my hometown, we run a, a big junior spiel that Caitlin was a part of this year as well. Um, it's just so important that that next generation of curlers has an opportunity to to learn the game, uh, to learn from us, to feel that they can, that we're approachable uh, and that we're willing to give back. So that's going to be a big part of the Aztec event next year, as well as I know Caitlin and Jeff have a few other ideas um, that are going to go on on that Thursday night and, and just try to make it an event that, you know, the Lloyd Minster community will get behind and support and, and come out and watch. Um, and when you do an event properly, the way that uh, we're going to and the way that Jeff and Caitlin plan on doing, uh, it's going to bring a lot of investment into the community as well, be it hotels, food, uh, just supporting the entire community. So there'll be a lot of good things that come out of this. And um, yeah, and the junior curlers are definitely a, a big piece of that. Thank you so much, Mark, for all the information. It was an honor to talk to you and we will see you once again in January. Awesome. Thanks, pal. And uh, go Oilers. Take care, man. And now it's time for us to check in once again with Shelby Clark for an extended look at your evening weather forecast. Thanks so much again there, Mr. Jace Mackey. Yes, now taking another extended look at your weather forecast. We'll be starting off with our central zone of the provinces. And we have cooled down uh, slightly for today. We are kind of still seeing the conditions as what we saw yesterday. But of course, compared to last week, we have definitely dropped, which is also very nice. A nice break indeed. Uh, most spots are just still sitting at that 15 degree mark for today. And right now, we're looking at that 14, 13 for Edson and down in Rocky Mountain House. And 17 and 18 for Edmonton and Athabasca. And hopefully everybody in this area here, especially in Edson, are being safe, uh, still staying safe after, of course, all the smoke and the grass fires and whatnot. Uh, switching over to our Saskatchewan side, they are kind of matching with us on our Alberta side, but still looking slightly warmer just by a couple degrees. Uh, we have that 20 and 21 still up here in the border city and up in Cold Lake, 20 as well over in North Battleford, and then we start to slightly cool down from there. 19 down in Saskatoon, while the 16 up in Meadow Lake and the rest there with Prince Albert Melford just sitting at 15. Now, as you go 
over to our northern zone. They are uh, still matching with those temperatures uh, compared to our central area, especially on our Saskatchewan side, uh, with most spots just seeing around 20 to 21 degrees. And then we have a couple that are just sitting at 18 with Uranium City and down in South End. And Flum Flon is still looking at uh, the coolest conditions compared to the rest, just sitting at 13 degrees. Going back over to Alberta side here, they are slight, they have slightly warmed up compared to what they have been seeing yesterday. They were matching with us more in our central zone with around that 15 to 16 degree mark. And now they are seeing with most spots just at 20 to 21. And then down in Grand Prairie and Slave Lake, still kind of sitting at those teams with 16 in Grand Prairie and 13 there in Slave Lake. Now as we go over to our southern zone, uh, they have cooled down quite a bit as well. They are matching with us more in our central zone. The northern zone seems to be seeing the warmest conditions yet. Now the southern zone has matched with us a bit more in our central and are still just sitting at those teens. But even in Calgary and Banff, as Banff is still looking at that single digit, Calgary has cooled down quite a bit, now just sitting at 11 degrees. And then we start to warm up a bit more as we head more into the center here. Uh, 15 for both Medicine Hat and Coronation and Lethbridge continues to see the warmest condition there just at 7 a few degrees off from that 20 degree mark. Going back over to our Saskatchewan side here in our southern zone, they are seeing kind of a, a switch up in temperatures in some of these areas. Uh, we got Kindersley and Regina just at 20 degrees, so they are seeing the warmest conditions there. And then Moose Jaw and Yorkton are just underneath them. And then for Estevan and Swift Currents, they have flipped the script, and they are just at 13 and 14, so they have cooled down quite a bit from what they have been seeing yesterday. Now as we look at some overnight evening lows for our temperatures, we are going to still be seeing some nice plus temperatures for our evening lows. So expecting to, uh, some nice warm evening evenings for tonight. Most spots are expecting a low of 6 to 7 degrees tonight. Meadow Lake will be expecting a low of 4, but we are still for the most part seeing some beautiful temperatures and we aren't seeing a high chance of some precipitation sadly, like you know usually we uh, are wanting to see that as we are just trying to kind of get rid of some of these dry conditions. But we are going to be seeing a low chance of some rainfall for most of these areas. It's going to be ma mainly clear and uh, partly cloudy through uh, the most part on this list. Now looking at our hourly forecast for our Wednesday here in the border city, we are going to be seeing a beautiful day again for our Wednesday, starting off with that 7 degree, uh, seven degree mark right off in the morning. Then through the mid-afternoon, we will be hitting that 20 degree mark. So we will be hitting that 20 degrees, uh, looking slightly warmer compared to what we have been seeing for the past couple days this week. And then we will just be cooling down to that 14 as we head into tomorrow evening because then we will be warming up for our Thursday at 24 for our daytime high with a mixture of some sun and cloud. And we start to even warm up from there as we head into the weekend. 26, 27 for our Friday and Saturday. And we are expecting some sunnier days ahead. So please make sure to get outside and enjoy it. Hopefully this won't hurt, you know, those dry conditions with all the grass fires and whatnot. So hopefully we will be seeing some precipitation. But for the most part, we are expecting some beautiful days ahead for the weekend. Sunday, especially for Mother's Day. Please make sure to get out there and treat your mama on a beautiful day with that 30 degree mark. And we will be seeing those beautiful conditions continue on into next week. And that's all I have for now. Our Jason Mackey will have our news coming up after the break. joining me from the Harvest Collective Market today on Primetime Local News. And we have a special market coming up this weekend, Terry. It's your spring market. Uh, first of all, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about the market this weekend, Terry. What is planned? All right, so we've got 40 um, handmade vendors from across the prairies. Uh, we try to get as many as we can from the local area, uh, but we've got some vendors coming from Saskatoon and area and a few traveling from Edmonton and then lots from kind of the surrounding area. Um, yeah, it's just a fun day to get out and shop and support some small businesses. Now, if anybody uh, has had a chance to attend one of these before, Terry, can you tell me what they can expect as far as what type of items will be available for sale? Absolutely, yeah. Um, we've always tried to have a good variety, which is why we kind of select from um, the outside area as well, um, just to ensure we're covering all our bases, but lots of jewelry, uh, home decor, candles, clothing, um, sign makers. There's just, there's a little bit of something for everything. There's baked goods. Um, we have a cash bar so you can grab a drink while you shop and uh, just take your time and browse and enjoy the day. Is there an admission fee for this event, Terry? 
we don't charge admission. We do collect optional donations at the door. Every market we um, pick a local organization to collect donations for. Um, for this market, we've selected the Residence and Recovery Family Healing Center. Um, so we're looking for donations, um, infant items, diapers, wipes, baby shampoo, that kind of thing. Um, we'll also have a little raffle at the door for the first time this year. Um, a bunch of local businesses, salons and spas and bakeries and things have donated items or gift certificates that you can bid on, or I'm um, sorry, buy a ticket um, and we'll do a little raffle draw and all the funds raised from that will also go um, to residents in recovery. So if you'd rather do a monetary donation, there's also kind of a reward in it for you as well. So Terry, what day and time is the event and uh, how long does it last and where is it? Yes, so it's uh, this Saturday, May 13th from 10 till 4 at Nissan Hall, which is the former Wild Rose Pavilion at the Lloyd X. Um, and yeah, 10 till 4. Terry, you guys have had traditionally good turnouts for these events. And now that the weather is nice, you know, it kind of gives people an excuse to get out. And, and what a great way to support local as well. Um, have you had feedback from the vendors and talking about how they, uh, you know, enjoy being part of, the, of this? Yeah, it's really just like a day of community coming together. Um, small businesses, these kind of events are huge for our types of um, business, getting to like talk with customers one on one, for people to be able to touch and feel the products when normally you're just buying through Etsy or through a website. Um, it's just a fun day. We have so many vendors that return year after year. Um, so I, I think it's a pretty <laughs> fun day. People keep coming back. So, so yeah, you should definitely come check it out if you haven't been for sure. All right, Terry. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, once again, just please go over the location and time for the Harvest Collective Market on Saturday. Yes. So May 13th on Saturday from 10 till 4 at Nissan Hall at the Lloydminster X. All right, Terry. Well, thanks so much for joining us and good luck with the event. Thank you so much for having me. Furniture set and design supplied by Furniture Gallery, downtown Lloydminster. Joining us today for Primetime Local News is author Sebastian de Castell. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sebastian. Really excited to be able to speak on your new novel. Thanks for having me. Really happy to be able to have you on here and speak on your new book called The Melvant Seven. Sounds like it's going to be really interesting. So starting off with the most easy question, can you kind of explain what this book is all about? Sure. So uh, The Malevolent Seven is a fantasy adventure novel. It's uh, about a band of seven, uh, what are called in the book, wondrous. They're basically mercenary wizards who sell their spells to the highest bidder. Um, unfortunately, the highest bidder is usually kind of a jerk. And so they get themselves into a situation that they're not sure how to get out of. And um, we're talking about seven very troubled people who see themselves as uh, very much not being heroic at all. Uh, but uh, unfortunately for them, as for all of us, every once in a while, even the worst of us has to be a little heroic. There's a lot of, there's a lot of dark humor. There's a lot of um, kind of wild magic systems and stuff like that. So I hope a lot of readers are going to enjoy it. Well, I think this is a really cool idea. Now, would you say there was something that inspired you to write this? I guess almost, I think all fantasy authors secretly want to write a, a Magnificent Seven with wizards. Um, and then eventually, you know, some of us just do. Uh, um, for me, I think it was, I, I was really interested in this notion of people seeing themselves as the villain. And we live in kind of an unusual time that way, where because we're sort of dividing the world up into good people and bad people, and a bad person is anyone who does, a, you know, a bad thing, we sort of go, okay, well, I'm going to write that person off. I was kind of interested in writing about characters who saw themselves as already having been written off and therefore just go, right, fine, we're, we're the villains. But then what happens if you see yourself as the villain, but then there's someone's at a car crash or someone needs your help, or in this case, there's a conspiracy that's going to enslave humanity. Um, are you going to sit by the sidelines? And if you, and if you step into that void, are you becoming a hero yourself or are you still forever doomed by your past? And so I think that's what kind of drew me to those very broken wizards. And for previous work, I'm assuming you have seen some great support in the past, of course. So do you think you'll be seeing that same support for this novel that's going to be coming out here? I sure hope so. The thing about being a novelist is that, you know, it's almost like any other 
sort of work of art. Like we, we're so used to the, the entertainment business and, and when you see things like Marvel movies, which can be tons of fun, they sort of always know how it's going to open. You know, they have all of these cues along the way. But with novels, I think it's very different. I think, you know, if, if you know, five people who are watching right now pick up the book and fall in love with it, um, they might actually launch a huge wave and all of a sudden the book becomes a bestseller. Whereas, you know, we have other examples of very famous authors who've been very successful who suddenly put out a book and they have every reason to believe that everyone's going to enjoy it. But then all of a sudden it just lands flat. So I've been tremendously lucky to have a lot of readers who have gone from the Great Coat series, which was swashbuckling adult fantasy, to Spellslinger, which was young adult magical fantasy, and have gone through sort of all of my books. Um, there was a review from the Financial Times in the United Kingdom, which is a you know, very big newspaper, um, and it, they gave it this really lovely review. Um, but I was sort of confused because I, I didn't even know the Financial Times, you know, reviewed books. And so sometimes you'll get these reviews from just all different places in the world, especially if your books uh, are published worldwide or I've been lucky that my books have been, a lot of my books have been translated into other languages. And so um, it's always wonderful and it's always fun because it's coming from different places. And usually the most fun, of course, is when you're just getting letters from readers who say, you know, I was really down or I was down on myself and I didn't know kind of what I was doing and I read this book. And one of the things that I think fantasy does particularly well is allow, allow us to imagine ourselves in a, in a very different setting, but still retain who we are and ask, how would I deal with that situation? And I think that that can be a very kind of healing process. So those are kind of my favorite reviews are the ones coming straight from readers. Yeah, that's really amazing to hear how you're helping people out there in uh, your own way. I think that's really interesting. Now, is there any other teasers you can let us know about any future work that you have coming out here that you can kind of let readers and your fans know about? Yeah, I've actually got a lot of different books coming out in the, in the next 12 months. So uh, so the Malevolent 7 is coming out this week. Uh, it's uh, May 11th in the UK and Australia, and then May 16th in North America. And then in August, the third of the Argosy books is coming out, which is a young adult uh, fantasy series that I'm incredibly proud of. And so I, I hope more people discover that. And then in March of uh, 2024, Play of Shadows comes out, which is the first book in the new Great Coat series, which is the swashbuckling series. That's the one I get the most letters about people going, you know, when is this coming out? When is this coming out? Um, and it's kind of, you know, they're so they're all so dear to my heart. So for me, it's always, you know, I, I can't wait for people to see it. But because of the way publishing works, it can take quite a while. And so I just have to keep sending out these emails when people ask saying, you know, it's coming soon. So there's a lot more. And then there's a secret book that I'm going to put out probably in November, December. So but I can't say anything about that yet. <laughs> no, no, that's no problem whatsoever. You know, I had to try. So no, thank you so much for letting us know about some other things that are coming out. And of course, that secret uh, project that's going to be coming out soon. I bet many readers and fans will be excited to hear about your future work. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today and good luck on your newest novel. Thanks so much, Shelley. Ending off with another quick look at your seven day forecast. We are seeing some beautiful days ahead for tomorrow 21 so we will just be seeing past that 20 degree mark and a mixture of some sun and clouds so please make sure to get outside and enjoy it hopefully we will be seeing you know little spots of uh, showers throughout this week kind of help wet things down so we don't have as much dry conditions but you know i guess we uh, really enjoy seeing those sunnier days as well uh 24 thursday so we will start to warm up after wednesday as we head into the weekend 26 27 so just a few degrees off from that 30 degree mark as we head into the week on Friday and Saturday. So we are experiencing a beautiful weekend that's going to be coming up here and 30 will be hitting that Sunday just in time for Mother's Day. So please make sure to treat your mama and get outside and enjoy it. Maybe if you got a lake lot, get out there, take a walk at uh, Bud Miller Park. And as we head into next week, we will continue those nice warm conditions with 29 next Monday and seeing those 20 degrees next Tuesday and Wednesday. I know Shelby is someone who's going to be at her lake spot this weekend. Got to go out and enjoy it because spring has officially sprung. Summer's right around the corner. That's our show for this Tuesday night. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we'll see you again here tomorrow.